over 3,000 years ago, upon the soil of this world, was interwoven a tapestry of mighty and vast peoples. Great kingdoms and huge empires, spanning over hills and mountains, along coastlines and across seas. We know of this world from many places. The mortuary temple of Amenhotep III. This temple was carved with strange names of foreign lands, put into a list. Far away in the Hittite lands, spoken on the stone of monuments to great battles won. And in the center, Ugarit, clay trade records of ancient tablets for the merchant cities. We think of our modern world as unique in its interconnection, but long ago in that time, between them, over deserts and waters, was tied a huge net of commerce, politics, and culture. You already likely know of Egypt, of its vast Nile River Kingdom, but that is its modern name. It called itself Kemet, the black land, for the fertile dark earth along the river banks. Down the river until it met the Mediterranean at the delta. Beyond whose waves sat the Minoans, an island people. From ancient Crete they set sail, and from their fortunes in that earlier mentioned trade, built lavish palaces. These palaces would later inspire the myths of the labyrinth and the Minotaur. Further north, some of the earliest Greeks, the Mycenaeans, lived. But these are not yet the fighters of Alexander's time. He will not be born for another millennium. He is as close to these people as we are to the Norman conquests. However, these Greeks did cross the Aegean. Mycenaean warriors and mercenaries fought in the land that called Willusa. In that place existed a massive walled city, a huge trade hub for ships coming through the Dardanelles. We know it mainly from the stories as Troy. But Willusa itself was nothing but a small exterior territory to the largest empire there, the Hittites. From their powerful cities like Hattusa, their empire stretched out across the Anatolian plate and its tectonic mountain ranges. Those mountains had streams, and those streams came together to make rivers. The Tigris and the Euphrates. Like the Nile, they nourished civilization with their floodwaters. The powerful Assyrians lived upriver, creators of some of the first fighting machines and their battering rams and siege towers. Downriver, however, lay legendary Babylonia. It is remembered in imaginations for its hanging gardens, its ziggurats, that inspired Babel's tower. Lapis lazuli was traded here from further east, and the wondrous blue of the Ishtar Gate showed that wealth in trade. Part of that trade passed by even more lands further east, like Elam, passing through the gulf to where those twin rivers entered the sea. And in the center of this world, along the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, lay the Canaanite trade cities, Ugarit, Tyr, and Byblos the cedar trees of that land making the finest trade ships. These ships to all lands would go, bringing with them the origins of our alphabet. One day these peoples and their ships would also found Carthage. But something else united them, you see. Something more important. The final land I will mention is Cyprus. The reason for its importance was not simply because it was a central point for trade. No. It is in the material that could only be possible thanks to Cyprus. The Super Chagokin, the Super Alloy, the name of this era, Bronze. Cyprus's name is linked to that of copper, Cyprium, the metal of Cyprus. The easiest access to it were mines on this island. The other half, of course, was tin. Though some small mines existed in Anatolia, the main mines were in the mountains of what today we would call Afghanistan. The same area Lapis Lazuli would be mined. Along the trade routes it would pass, over land or by the Gulf's ports, up the twin rivers, past Elam and Babylonia, into Canaan, and through ports like those at Ugarit, to the Hittites, Mycenaeans, and Egypt. This was the network of that world. This one resource hooked and wove the world together. The Uluburum shipwreck had inside its hold some 354 copper ingots and a ton of tin. Combined, it would make 11 tons of bronze. A lost fortune, a sunk tanker. Bronze was the ichor of that time, 
It beat in the veins of vast trading empires. The greatest substance, all the finest tools were made in bronze, and thus all the greatest works. The mightiest symbols and architecture of those days were best cut and chiseled, sawed and worked using this fantastic material. And of course, as well, the strongest armor was forged in bronze. The finest weapons were bronze. Even though it was softer than iron, it never fully tarnishes, never truly loses its edge. Its green, sacrificial outer layer locking in its power. And beyond that, of course, the finest, most powerful machines are light on bronze. The Assyrian siege engines, capped in huge bronze rams, or massive bronze axes to smash down city walls. And the greatest, fastest machine of all, the chariot, the ultimate flanking vehicle, able to move archers and fighters swiftly across the battlefield like no other. These units could not dominate without the super material. 3,000 years have passed since then, but we find ourselves in a new world. A world obsessed with new precise resources. A world with new specific trade routes, new empires, and a world with new expensive precise machines. New chariots preparing and waiting to do battle upon the same ancient soils of those lands. Africa had been fast, constant movement, constant combat, maneuver warfare. In comparison, our redeployment to Syria had happened weeks and weeks and weeks ago. Forward operating base Mustaha. The horizon stretched on and on. It was flat, it was hot, it was sandy. But even worse, its days were mundane. This had been an oil well site before it was a forward operating base. First it had been Syrian, then ISIS had taken it, then others, and now we guarded it. Its creaking oil derricks and rusting pumps. It was like Mad Max, our own little gas town. Long and empty. There was no battle, there was no fight. Until night. fire alarm sounded, and they would attack us. They fired mortars and long-range rockets in the base of defense of the ship. And the next day would begin exactly like the previous day. We would estimate the firing position of the attack the previous night, 
based on the angle of fire and send a new patrol out to go there and scout. In the day we would talk to each other to pass the time, have banal conversations, conversations about fucking anything, anything to take our mind off another day here, another long stretch of heat and dust and grit. We just sat here and moved crates from what seemed to be one end of the base to the other, boring and just stretching on. We repaired things that broke down in the heat and sand, and then waited to fix what the heat and sand break next. Then in the afternoon we would eat dinner. God, it was good to eat. It was shit food, but it was something. The previous day's patrol would then come back in through the north gate of the base, having found nothing and no one at the launch sites. But then night would come again, and that fucking alarm. The feeling of tension and stress building up again. And then, just like that, you wake up, and it's another day. A new patrol would leave through the south gate around dawn. Go out to a spot where last night someone, the enemy, had been. But to find no one. One day, maybe it was a Tuesday, I forget. We found the mechs needed improved anti-sand electrostatic filters for the turbines. The Abrams had had some kind of similar issue back in 91. These high-spec engines are bad like that. They don't like corrosion. At some point, it started to build up. It had started back in Africa, but I put my mind off of it. But then I began to notice, two or three weeks in, I noticed my heartbeat would pound for no reason at random times. My jaw would ache. I would just feel tense, and it never fully went away. Chinese resale things. Jury rigged to fly over the base and drop a mortar round or an IED. They were launched in swarms. They probably only cost $300 a pop. They were shredded by the sea ram. Later, the remnants of the dragon storm that had hit the Middle East hit us. Sucked up dust in these waves that would just last for days. This haze. It made the day into a gray beige smear of fuzz. When it all started, I could not wait. I was so pumped that I would finally pilot my machine. This would be it. Finally, my ability to prove it to myself and to the world. And I tore into Africa with my training and excitement. But now the excitement was gone, but I was still here. It was like being on a submarine. It was like being stuck in a narrow cave. The fear came in the night with the alarm, with the attacks. It never killed us, the shell never landed, but the tension never left. And then another day, another morning, another patrol. The tension was there still, but now it ebbed. Like a tide, it left me during the day. Someone had a guitar, I forget who, one of the intel guys, and he would play it. And he would not mind if he was just messing around, really fucked up, because it was just there to take your mind off another day here. I would wake up sometimes, two, three times a night at worst, with this feeling, this horrible feeling, like I was about to die, like everything was wrong, like the shell was about to hit me. But then there was nothing, there was no threat, 
No big attack. And I would just go back to sleep. And the night would come again. I was a rope. I was drawn taut. Allowed to slack a little bit, but never unwind. And every night they would reach out from wherever they were and they would pull me tense again, make my heart pound and my breath tighten and my teeth ache. Who were they? Were they the Daesh? Were they FSA remnants? They were a non-enemy. They were the days, and the heat, and the dust, and the fucking haze. The only way through the cave was forward. The brown sky and brown sand melted into each other. The only way through was another wait for the sandstorm sun to ply its way through the desert ocean. I was a pilot for a machine that had not moved in weeks. My metal body rusting still as my mind wound itself around a rock of stress. And then, one night it happened. think was yes finally started my machine. I had to cover Amber 2 and 3 while they cold started their machines. Patrol ran into unidentified packs on the move. They're getting chewed the fuck up. All Amber victors get out there and cover our boys. Cords incoming. No wonder the attack had come early tonight. We had caught them. And now, the enemy, whoever they were, they were throwing everything at the base to buy time for their screw-up. Final systems checks. We just need to get to that fucking pad. There's no room for error. Switch to lower camera to check arms. Sensor, power, weapons, drivers, motors, engine, all green. Amber March, launch. Good launch. Me in the middle, two and three on either flank. Assuming combat spread. Attack Chevron. Three units, 500 to one kilometer apart. These things like leg room, so you give it to them.
across the 15 kilometer distance in around 9 minutes flat. From post start, it had only taken us 15 minutes from the stress signal to our arrival at the combat zone. There was numerous enemy technicals firing on them from the hill, so I opened fire. Ember 1, the lead vehicle is disabled with possible wounded. Provide supporting fire and keep them covered. Ember 2, flank left. Amber 3, flank right. There, that's the disabled Hummer. Smoke discharge. When two forces encounter each other by surprise, it's a meeting engagement. When a meeting engagement escalates, it becomes a pitched battle. In a pitched battle, any advantage you can take, you do. Speed is of the essence, maneuvering as well. The high maneuverability armored combat system is ideal for this. Amber 3 cross strafe the hill and lit it up. Amber 2 then hit them right afterwards. I punched right down the middle. We tore apart the technicals one after another. After the adrenaline wore off, I stopped by one of the destroyed technicals. Its ammo was cooking off, popping all around me. Amber 1, hold position. Amber 2, proceed south so you can destroy. Amber 3, swing east and move back. We had completely routed and devastated them. The flares burned in the distance. We lost six. Four died when the lead vehicle was destroyed or shortly thereafter, and two more who tried to save them. In return, we destroyed 17 technicals outright. Three were damaged and later abandoned. Three were destroyed by rifle grenades. 14 by Amber Marches, rockets, heavy machine gun, and Type 12 cannons. We killed 68 of them and wounded 27 more. In their vehicles, we found mortar and drone equipment. The base would receive no further night attacks. The tension in my chest was slightly lighter. I had made progress. But the next day it was still there. I was still in the middle of whatever this was. This conflict, this anxiousness, this tension. There was only one direction, and that was forward. Syria, like many Middle Eastern nations, had large natural gas and oil reserves. During the Cold War, the U.S., CIA, and Soviet KGB used a proxy power approach to either influence or gain control of these nations, directly or indirectly, for these resources. But then the Cold War ended. In the coming decades, these authoritarian states maintained their power by continuing to supply these resources. But something built up in the background. A new generation was born. This generation of Middle Easterners were faced with an inherently broken system, one designed to cement singular leaders in the flow of resources, even if it meant a complete blockade of social advancement inside their own nations for their own people. Thus, in the wake of the 2008 financial collapse, the Arab Spring in 2011 began. Massive protests and swaths of nations attempted to overturn these systems, for better or worse. Through all of this, Syria remained dormant, apparently stable under its leader Bashar al-Assad. In truth, like a chain of volcanoes, Syria was merely hiding the largest eruption. And so, on the 15th of March, a decade before Amber One got there, the Syrian civil war began, as discontent ignited the Sunni Muslims long suppressed within Syria. The opposition was suppressed violently, and then the country descended into turmoil. 
Why this involved so many larger players was simple. Syria's ties lay towards Russia economically in particular. Syria's natural gas reserves were sold to Europe through Russia's petrochemical empire. Syria also lay opposite the U.S.'s interests in Saudi Arabia, and at the Shiite Crescent, stretching out from Iran to the Mediterranean. So Syria was an access point. The reason politicians like Hillary Clinton suddenly cared about who Bashar al-Assad was, was this. If there was a turn in the weather in Syria, then the U.S. could potentially block Iran's political power, push Russian interests from the Mediterranean, and hit them hard by cutting them from their resources inside Syria. But there was a problem. Try as they might to paint Assad as an exceptional tyrant, he sadly was not. And for them, what was even worse, Syria's war was a land of no more heroes. It was morally grey, a confusing mess of internal factions. So Assad could have his attacks kill civilians, but then so too would the Free Syrian Army's battles do the same. It was the worst kind of war. It was modern war. Modern civil war. Drawn out, bloody, and with no clear winner or loser. And so, for the first half of the decade, the Syrian refugee crisis would cause ripples around the world. Combined with the Arab Spring's aftershocks, it would partially be the cause of attacks across Europe. Migrants washing ashore in Italy, and shootings and stabbings in France. And as the stability of Syria was now a distant memory, a horrible force, one born from the hardened militants of northern Iraq and their fight against the U.S., would take advantage of this chaos to invade. ISIS, ISIL, Daesh, though Syria's story here lacks any one villain, it now had a wealth of inhuman monsters. A group so seemingly evil, so extreme in their actions, they fall into that category of things any seemingly sane person would address simply with complete horror and hatred, alongside those like the Nazis. But then, another group emerged. If the previous were monstrous, then this group was seemingly the mirror opposite. Despite how cynical history can be, sometimes things line up just right. An ethnic group, largely living in the mountains of Zagros and Taurus, they had the unfortunate fate of little political power when the old empires of Europe drew up new borders. Thus the people called the Kurds were left with no homeland. The Kurds, and their militias, the YPG, were the polar opposite of ISIS. Where ISIS destroyed schools and forced women, off their underage girls, into servitude towards his husbands forcibly, the Kurds in the YPG built schools and had women join their ranks as fighters of their own volunteer. Where the Daesh were religious extremists, the Kurds were religiously tolerant. From the chaos of civil war, the Kurds slowly fought back by tooth and nail against ISIS. Thus, from 2015, the U.S. had what they were looking for, a side within Syria's chaos to support. It is hard to find a better group so deserving of renown for their battles as being good fights. Amongst the conflicts of the 21st century, and by just war theory, the YPG was truly doing the right thing. Perhaps the most right fight of the entire first two decades anywhere on Earth. And so year after year, the Kurdish YPG, now with air support from the US, tore apart the monster of ISIS city by city, town by town, road by road. The Kurds attempted to grow a nation of their own from the rugged and barren soils of Syria. Seemingly, Syria would have, at least in some parts, a new peace. And if the story concluded here, if saner minds and worthy leaders had acted responsibly, then Amber One would never have stepped foot in Syria. The Kurds with US backing would have had their own nation. Daesh would be wiped from the face of the earth. Assad would likely, with the Syrian government forces, have brokered a new order, and the Syrian refugees could eventually have returned home. But instead the world unfurled, as selfish, simple-minded men of power acted selfishly and simple-mindedly. The tragedy of Syria and the reason behind the arrival and creation of UN Mossad, the role Amber One was to play in it, will unfold very soon.